Okay, so as part of this series, we're going to be looking into various bits of equipment and outdoors equipment, stuff like that. Um, but we're going to start off with the the trinity of things that are very difficult to sort out if you're out and about and you haven't got access to shops or anything like that. So imagine you're out and suddenly transported into the woods and the three things that I would say are the most important for you to have are a knife, fire and some light source. So this is a little pack that I put together years ago. Um, the primary part of which is an Opinel number no. 9 knife. These are very, very good knives. They last for years. This one's well over 10 years old. And um, they're a simple um, twist lock knife, the sort of thing your granddad would carry around in the garden or your grandma. And, uh, you know, it served me really, really well. It's a carbon steel blade, so it's great for striking sparks off the back. Got a nice 90 degree edge on it. It's not a very sturdy knife, you'd have to think very carefully about what you were going to do with it. It could easily be broken if you tried to batten, uh, that is to cut wood, by pounding on the back of the knife edge with a, with a stick. This would probably break if you did that with it, but it is extremely easy to keep sharp. Um, it's really sturdy. I've made one or two um, uh, modifications to this in that normally the Opinel doesn't have this divot. And this is there so that it's much easier to open if you're wearing gloves or if it's or if the weather's damp and the wood swelled a little bit. If you look at it like this, it's got a much deeper sort of bit where you can grab the blade in order to open it up. So if the wood swelled up because it's damp or it's got wet, you've got a better chance of getting it open. It's extremely easy to sharpen. It's one angle blade, so you just literally lay it flat on a sharpening stone and just grind it along and it'll, it'll become razor sharp very very quickly. It's nice and easy to keep clean um, even though this one's really old. There is discolouring on the blade. If you can see that. there, um, And that's because it is carbon steel. It doesn't rust but it does discolour. That's why stainless steel was invented. Okay and also the other modification I made is put a little eyelet in the back that's just a screw in eyelet and that means you can hang it around your neck and it's perfectly safe if you twist the lock closed it's not going to open accidentally it'll hang around your neck really nice right so and this is a little sheath that I made just out of a piece of um, webbing just made a little sheath with a little loop at the back to take a piece of paracord so you can hang it around your neck and it's got a couple of pieces of elastic sewn onto it so you can put a lighter in, and this lighter is just a cheap lighter. You can usually get them three or four for a pound at any pound store. It's perfectly good, get a fire lit for you, but it's also got an LED torch in it. So you've got knives, fire and light. So you've got those three things all in two objects that will hang around your neck in a simple thing. And that's the very sort of first knife I'd recommend you get. It's not very threatening. People aren't worried by it if they see it. And it's just a very good set uh, and I highly recommend it. So it's probably less than £10 for the knife, the lighter and probably making the sheath. So perhaps we'll go into making an Opinel sheath if I get enough requests for it. But they're pretty simple. So just fold it back on itself, create a little loop for the paracord and you're done. And that's your, your, your primary three things to have out in the bush. And that, I guess, is why you use Magic Lantern. Okay, so this is the Baofeng UV5RTP. The 5R is the uh, model number and the TP stands for triple power. Um, it's a very interesting little radio and uh, whilst I can't officially recommend it for um, sort of bug out communications it is extremely simple to use. Um, the reason I can't recommend it for bug out preparations is that technically you need an amateur radio license um, to operate one because it is essentially a compact ham radio, it's a little portable radio, it's got all the features you'd need. Um, there he is, it's turned on now. 
comes in effect. Um, the lights for the backlit display can be changed to any color, as can the uh, transmit button, which I've got it as purple. Um, and it does all sorts of interesting things. So it'll allow you to receive FM radio by pressing this button. So you can just about hear that. Um, and it's got a little light on the, on the end there that you can use as a torch. So when it's on, the so So uh, there you go. So uh, you've got like a tiny little flashlight with you and an FM radio, and you've got your interesting sort of comms. Now, if you were to use one of these without an amateur radio license, and by the way, the foundation license is well within your anybody's grasp. It's just a very basic level of um, you know license teaches you about how radio works and how to set up an amateur radio, and then your you know your license is good forever basically they'll contact you about once every five years to make sure of your address and you'll continue wanting the call sign but that's about it um, but you could use these um, I mean right so here is the uh the haul I got from the local supermarket with the uh, £6.41 in change. I went slightly over and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, so, what we've got is just a, a, a quick sort of basket of food, stuff that will keep you going for a few days if everything gets stopped or you're stuck indoors or you know you get snowed in or anything, anything like that, or even a, a possibly a zombie apocalypse. So we're going to just go around here and uh, with my uh, magic silver chopstick, take that Harry Potter. I'm just going to go through the whys and wherefores of each of them. Now, number one, um, we've got six litres of water in three reusable water bottles. It's really cheap to buy water in quantity. As long as you don't want, you know, special spring water or anything like that, just water in two litre bottles, which means that it's quite survivable. If you lose one bottle, you're not going to lose all six because you of one puncture. You need to puncture all three of them to lose that. It's sealed. It's purified. It's absolutely essential and a real hassle to do. So if you're on day one and everything gets stopped or just your water gets cut off, you're good for a couple of days. Even if it's you're just going to use it for you know making hot beverages or anything like that, or even drinking, you've got six liters of water that will keep a person going for at least three days. Um, also bought because it's dead cheap, some uh, ordinary spaghetti. It stores for a very long time as long as you don't break the packaging, and we'll be looking into storing it for longer term use um, later on in the series. We've got two kilos of. Um, long grain rice it's very very cheap like ridiculously cheap and this will keep you know this will keep you fed for a very long time and it's extremely portable ask the ask about Japanese World War II rations and you'll have seen that there would be an awful lot of rice in it it's great for you keeps a third of the world alive on a regular basis you should have it in your preps and it's good bulk it's good for trade you know, so you can trade it for other goods if you are in that sort of position and everything's broken down. But if you just need some food to keep you alive, rice is always good. Um, got three of these pasta in tomato and onion sauce. They're a good single meal. They don't take a lot to prepare. You just literally pour it into a pan, add water, boil it for a bit, and the pasta all cooks itself. It's pretty good. Um... And then I went on to something that had zillions of calories in, in it. Uh, you know, get you some fruit and some sugar and some carbs and uh, dairy in. And this is ready to serve custard. Got three tins of that because it was dirt cheap. I think it was about 17 pence. So like 22 cents a can. Um, and some to go with it, three cans of sliced peaches. Now that's, you know, that's a good dessert for two people. 
So, you know, you've essentially got six dessert meals that have got lots of calories. I mean, these have about 300 calories per tin and the peaches are similar. So, you know, that's uh, 900, 1800 calories for about £1.50. So I think figured that was a good spend for food. And it's the sort of thing I like to eat as well, which is another thing. You should always buy stuff that you're happy to eat, that you'd eat if you were just a little bit low on funds and you couldn't go out shopping or you wanted to stretch out your groceries for, for, for a while because you weren't earning as much. Got two tins of sardines. Sardines are always good. The tins make quite good containers for other things if you can find a lid to put on them and these ones are in sunflower oil so you can even use the oil as a cooking medium for other things um, two cans of chicken soup because chicken soup and two cans of baked beans because again they were pretty much 25p a can so a pound made four meals which is always good so you've got four meals there if you add the sardines to anything maybe some you know, have some tomatoes and sardines with some pasta or just mix some sardines in with cooked rice. That's a, you know, pretty, that's Jap that's a Japanese meal. Um, and, you know, so you look at the combinations of how you'd want to do these things and how long it will keep you alive. And over in the corner here, we've got a tin of evaporated milk, which if you've got coffee or tea and you take it with sugar, evaporated milk, because it's canned, like a lot of this stuff, or a lot of cans, they will essentially keep forever. So you've got, you know, some milk for tea and coffee or you've got some milk to go on the sliced peaches or you can thin out or stretch out the custard if you need to, if you find it's too gloopy. Um, so that's, you know, all the food. And then the last thing is where I went over budget. Um, so essentially this was 60 pence for a kilo and a half of salt, which is nothing. You could probably even get it cheaper. So, I mean, I would happily, if I was going to keep to budget, and this would have been in budget, if I'd taken away one of the kilos of rice, which I'll do now, that would be within within a couple of pence of the £6.41 that I had in the penny pot. And that's a really good start. That's everything you need for three or four days. That would totally do you if everything got cut off and you couldn't buy food. So that's my roundup. This is my first sort of like prep challenge that I'll do. I plan on doing a couple of five pound challenges. If you're wondering about the why the salt is so important, salt is unbelievably hard to process if you haven't got access to a supermarket. I mean, it's processed as a, as a completely industrial sort of like, well, it's, it's a completely industrial process to get salt in a way that you understand it. If you what needed salt in this country anyway, even though we're an island, so we're especially lucky, um, you'd have to go to the shore, boil, probably to get this much salt, around 100 gallons of seawater, which would take a lot of fuel to boil it completely dry and get it to evaporate off so you're just left with the salt. I mean, generally speaking, you'd be left with brine, which people have been using to process meat um, for thousands of years. But essentially, with salt, you can cure meat, you know, especially pork. Um, you can cure fish. You can use it as an antiseptic. You can, you know, um, put it in water and then wash wounds with it. It's absolutely fantastic stuff and so useful and would become a bartering item in very short order if everything just suddenly shut down and you know this country especially if we were just making our own food salt would be an absolute godsend if you found a lot of it you'd be totally up for it it, 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 it i can't stress it enough having a, a a supply of salt would be absolutely invaluable so here is this is basically what you're looking at now is the i've turned my penny pot into three or four days of survival food or you start dividing that down and amongst the number of people you're looking after but for just looking down the back of the sofa or just empty you know looking in the backs of drawers to see if there's any small change this is what i managed to achieve it genuinely was my penny pot so i'm pretty pleased with that that will all go into my prep food cupboard and um hopefully that was sort of some help for you that hopefully that will teach you how to look at things and make sure that they're things that you'll eat stuff that you drink you know just get it all sorted uh and so it, i just wanted to show everybody that you know pre being a prepper it's not like some people have sort of explained that you need to set aside a hundred dollars a month for your prepping this this was literally you know the change i had kicking around and it properly is going to go into my um survival cupboard 
uh, my prepping cupboard for not just for like big disasters but for little things like when you haven't got as quite as much money you've got you know a good set of meals a good set of desserts you, you've done sensible prepping for long term with the salt and the water and uh, all of these things will go over again and I'm hoping to do a five pounds a month prepper challenge to add sort of like stuff to your store cupboard it's always a good idea to have a store cupboard if you talk to anybody over about 60 years old they'll they all i'd be very surprised if anybody that wasn't used to rationing hasn't got like a chunk of food that they can use in an emergency or if they're snowed in or anything like that so i thoroughly recommend it it's always a fun exercise and uh yeah on to the next bit